Coming to you live from Radio Canaan Studio. For the record. For the record. For the record. Here, Here from, from your, your government, government officials, officials, independents, and the opposition on issues that matter to you. The record. Engage in an open dialogue between residents and lawmakers. For the record. For the record. For the record. Informative, impartial, insightful. This is your talk show. 1 800 534 8255. Your calls, your input. This is For the Record. And now, your host, Arit Connor. Good morning and welcome to For the Record. Today being Monday, the 28th day of August 2017. I trust that all of those who are listening and viewing that you enjoyed your weekend. Uh, for those of you who are on the roads a little bit earlier than usual because of school, I want to thank you. I want to thank everyone for allowing Radio Cayman and by extension for the record into your homes, into your vehicles, as you traverse the busy roads of the Cayman Islands into your places of work, whether it be an office cubicle or if you're working in the outdoors for the record is a show produced by the staff and the management of Radio Cayman, and it is geared towards keeping you abreast of issues as they arise and play out on the local, regional, and international scene. I am your host, Doric Connor. My two co-hosts with me this morning, Dr. Steve McField and Ms. Theresa uh, Pitkern. You're welcome to join us in the conversation. Uh, you can call us on our toll-free number provided courtesy of Flow. That toll-free number is 1-800-534-8255. You can also call us on 949-8037 and 949-6990. Of course, if you don't like to talk on the telephone, then email us at for the record, one word, for the record, at C-A-N-D-W dot K-Y. If you do decide to call in, then you will be greeted by that beautiful radio voice of Miss Susan Watson. She will be there to greet you this morning. And of course, we encourage you to concern, uh, to get involved in the conversation. Uh, this is your radio station, Radio Cayman, your talk show for the record as well. Without any further ado, I want to say good morning to our two, my two co-hosts this morning, Dr. Steve McPhiel and Ms. Teresa Pitcairn. And I'll start with Ms. Teresa. I want to say to her, welcome back. She's uh, a world traveler, been traveling uh, the globe for the past few weeks. I must say that I envy her <laughs> for that. I was only able to go a short 40-something uh, minutes uh, plane flight, <laughs> you know, on mine. But welcome back. And you look Nice and refreshed from your journey as well. Thanks very much uh, for that um, very hearty welcome. Can I also uh, say thank you very much for uh, the listening audience for giving us an opportunity to share some time with them and we talk a little bit about what's been going on. And I had the opportunity yesterday to take a look at some of the discussions that you guys have been having. Okay. And uh, <laughs> you know me now, now that I've had a couple of winks, <laughs> I'm thinking that you are kind of like debating and, uh, you know, trying to traverse this kind of constitutional schizophrenia mm -hmm. that we continue to grapple with. Mm -hmm. So I suspect that we'll be continuing a little bit more on that conversation today. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, we, we, yeah. we will uh, concentrate on that. We also want to uh, take a closer look at the uh, strategic policy statement. Uh, okay. Uh, that's going to be interesting to see what the government has said that they want to, uh, want to achieve. Uh, a doc... Um, we want to share that with our listening audience because uh, they do have expectations out there. And it seems as if uh, the p policy of the government in some of the areas um, are looking to address some of the concerns that people have, in especially uh, the more, more vulnerable in our society as well. So we want to take a look at that also. Okay. Doc, good morning. How was the weekend? Good morning, uh, Mr. For the Record. Um, <laughs> and good morning to um, Teresa Pitcairn, who is back with us. Um, I hope she had a, a good a good holiday. Um, and good morning to all your listeners uh, locally and those that are listening to you abroad. Yes, um, I am okay. I had a good um, weekend, um, the weekend, and ready to go. Up, up this morning at 5 o'clock and ready to go. Um, yeah, um, what I what what I find is the um, it's the 
they, it's the same um, old rhetorical emphasis on what the rich and the powerful people want. Um, and they're driven by an, an unsatisfied appetite for more. As Rita, as Rita Franklin says, they can't get no satisfaction. So the government is providing um, all of the satisfaction for them that they seem to be able to do. And the little people in the communities, Scranton, Dog City, the swamp, all of those people, all of those places uh, seem to be left out. And, um, and it's the same old story. Now I understand instead of, um, instead of giving them um, community policing, that, that they promised while they had the meetings in the com- in different communities. Now they're talking about giving them police wardens. Um, that That is like going down the road and giving people a ticket that's parked on the wrong side or the, or, or who hasn't paid the, 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 um, the, the or, 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 who, or who's parking too close to the curb. And, and, and you would think that, you would think that, that the, 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 the crime and, and the and the incidents in the community was would be more in, more more important um, that the government would spend money on on safeguarding the communities instead the government is saying well we don't have the money to hire more policemen now to do that and I wonder the other thing I, I, I I'm trying to wrap my head around is whether or not they do not want to hire more Caymanian p- people in the police force or and this is a way to um to say well we'll hire wardens because who's going to be the wardens. Because like I've, I have said before, and I will say again, and I'll ask the police when they come on Wednesday, you have to have people from the communities who understand the communities, who understand the nuances, and who understand the psychology of the communities, people who understand the people there. You cannot bring people from a different community and people who are foreign to the community to understand the community. It will not work. I don't care how much money you put in it. You could put all the money in the world. It will not work. But I think, I think uh, in all fairness to the police, uh, Dr. McPhail, um, that – and. We haven't gotten all of the full details, and like you said on Wednesday, we will we, yeah. we will get more about it. But I have seen where calls are made for people to volunteer. So it is, you know, like they, the old saying: you can take the horse to the well, but you can't force him to drink. It is up to people in the communities who have an interest; those who, um, you know, vociferously claim that they are pro Caymanian, that they want their neighborhoods to be safe. Inst- they, instead of talking the talk, they, they have to walk the walk now. So the police are asking for people to volunteer, to come out and, you know, uh, and, and to volunteer for these jobs. They will train you, but they're asking you. So if you have an interest in your community, it is up to you then to, to get involved, you know, involved in it as well. But, but we don't have all of the details yet in terms of what, what it is. And I think uh, the jury is still out on it. So we need to wait and see exactly, you know, what they're talking about and get the experts to explain but, that. But to that's us. where I differ with you, <clears throat> OC. Uh, people were trained to wallet. People should be paid to do these jobs. Well, we don't know not, that, not, they, that they may not be paid But too. you said volunteer means mm-hmm. not volunteer. The word volunteer means means, <laughs> means that, yeah, yeah. Means that, means yes. that you that you're serving yeah, for yeah. nothing. Uh-huh. If the police from all these other places can get high pay with, with little results, then the Caymanian people who volunteer should, should who, 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 who train to give their time should be paid too. It shouldn't be just volunteer work. It's not a volunteer situation. Mm-hmm. It's a real die situation, where 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 people should 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 get compensation and, and consideration for what they for what they do. I don't believe in this volunteer business. It will never work. Okay. Um, before we go to a commercial break, we're gonna, we, we can't just let Miss Teresa come in she after um, how many months off? <laughs> she has so to tell us about a little bit her about her exploits. Um, I, I, I do know that uh, the formalities have now been uh, concluded in terms of your appointment with uh, FIFA uh, and everything. She even has her uh, ID card and all of that now as well. Tell us about that. <laughs> it's funny because we had a bit of a joke because the level of travel that it seems as though some folks will have, uh, uh, there were people talking about, well, she says, are we going to get diplomatic passports? Uh-huh. And then someone said, that's not too far-fetched. Um, and it's it's interesting because every time I travel, even though I don't do the 
uh, the consulting work that I used to do for FIFA anymore, given this role and I have to be pretty independent. Mm -hmm. um, the level of travel that was involved was pretty um, grueling. But one of the things that's really important for me is developing relationships. And if you don't speak the language, that is really, really a challenge. And you're often in a room with people who have um, a different cultural background, different age, they speak a different language. And the lingua franca, which you know used to be known as not having any kind of political bias, um, that's kind of not, that's, you know, you have to, start to learn to be engaging and to build relationship and get uh, to have a useful conversation with people. You need to speak the language. I was grateful that I had Mr. Fimbo many, many centuries ago that taught me Spanish because uh, French and Spanish, and they all have a Latin background. Mm -hmm. So it's you can struggle through having some type of um, conversation with people if you have access to some of the language. So... That was really good. So if there's anything from that experience that I'd like to share with our listening audience who are particularly involved with education is to embrace a new opportunity to start teaching to start, to start teaching more than maybe two languages in our school because I know that we do French and Spanish in most of the schools. But languages, Japanese, uh, Mandarin, uh, the world is is a smaller place today, you know. So that's one of the things I'd like to share. But to speak to the point that Mr. Macfield raised about uh, volunteerism, um, and as you know, we volunteer for this show, uh, and you know the amount of work that is involved with presenting a, num uh, a number of the conversations that we have. Um, we have seen that many of the boards that we have, uh, one, because of the indemnity that they have under the various legislation, and two, because their time is given for free, we see where a lot of important boards and their performance is not at the level that we'd like them to be. So I'm hoping that the, and I'm, I'm not going to, I don't know too much about what's going on with respect to this uh, change and in, inviting folks to participate. Um, but let us also look at the ways in which um, our boards have failed us on deeply, deeply challenging issues that we have today. Uh I think we have a little time. I want to talk about one board. I've seen some, I don't have all of the full details of it, but okay. it seems as if the liquor licensing board has gotten themselves in, 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 in a quandary in relation to the granting of some liquor license into a, a gas station or something. Yeah, so that <coughs> is Sorry. Yeah. And it has, to, you know, and, and the reason I'm raising it here, because I, you, you've been on several, several uh, boards, mm -hmm. um, and the, the way that decisions are made, we, we saw, for instance, in the Island Company's case, you remember that years mm -hmm. ago, yes. where mm -hmm. a decision was made by the board, um, supposedly duly recorded and everything else. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> when the letter goes out to the, to the applicant, it's completely different in a way from the board decision because overnight, you know, someone had gotten to board members or chair or whomever, and the decision changed. And this, we want to talk about this whole policy of announcing board decisions before minutes are ratified uh, and everything. With us being such a close-knit community, everybody knowing everybody, everybody wanting to influence everyone. If you have a friend on the board, as soon as that decision is made, that board uh, member may step out of the board meeting, get on the phone, and, oh, your application you know, was approved. And then you go and you act on the basis of that approval. And it seems as if in this particular case, not only the action was taken to the point where the business was actually operating um, when, in fact, the license supposedly had not been issued at that point in time. If we get an opportunity, we want to research that. But not to talk about the specific incident as much as to talk about the, the principles the, uh, yeah. and procedures, yeah. Yeah. you know, at a board level mm -hmm. and decision uh, making. And uh, Dr. Macfield, you you were the, um, the chair of the uh, Roads National Roads Authority, again, where decisions similar to that would be made. And uh, maybe... After the break, we'll come back and we'll talk, you know, yeah. about those procedures and how important it is. 
uh, talk about the, the, the implications of having public meetings uh, where the public is invited to attend those meetings because if they're hearing what go if the public's here and what goes on that, that means that as soon as that meeting is over you have to ratify your minutes because not only do your members know what the decisions are but the public knows as, as well so uh we'd like to talk about that let's take a commercial break when we return for the record we'll be back with you Good morning and welcome back to For the Record. I'm your host, Dart Connor. My two co-hosts with me this morning, Dr. Steve McField, Ms. Teresa Pitcairn. Um, one of our listeners uh, has sent in and said, the question is, when is an approval granted? Is it when the board makes a decision or is it when the applicant uh, receives it? Um, approvals are often made subject to conditions, so can there be an approval before the conditions are met? Two, 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 two um, very uh, valid points. Uh, so I want to bear those questions in mind. We'll take the caller, and uh, if the caller has any questions, then we'll include that, the answers to that caller along with the, the writer's question as well. Caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Uh, yes, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. How are you this morning? Fine, sir. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm fine. Um, I heard you all speaking about the police this morning, and that's what I'm calling about. Um, you know, the people in this country cannot speak up too much strongly about changing our policing to, to Caymanian policemen because we need the government. The government should be the one to get up and tell the commissioner and tell the dep the the the, um, the governor what they want, and then the people should go to the people and say, "Look, this is what we want. We're fighting for. We need your support." And then the people will get up with the government. But if the people don't have support, and the government will be their support, if they don't have that, they can't do anything. So that is how I feel about it, and. Um, because we cannot go to another country and get a job as a policeman. Ladies and gentlemen, have a nice day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much for that. Uh, let's take the uh, last caller first in terms of uh, the response. Well, uh, policing policing now is it's quite different from what it used to be in the old days. But the basic, the basic tenets of policing is still there. Community policing, beat work, on the beat in communities, no people from door to door, from house to house, from business to business. That has never changed throughout all of the the more scientific method of, of, of policing. That 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 foundation of policing has never changed. And so and and coming back to, to, to what the, the what the caller said about about uh Kibanyan policemen, one of the one of the tenants of policemen, and if you look and already you should you you should have this experience because you live in America, and you lived there during the fifties and sixties when they had all the riots in the, in the different communities. And one of the thing one of the things they found that came out of that that you cannot bring police from from say um, Bayonne, New Jersey, to a police in Brooklyn. You have to have people who know the projects, who know the streets, who know the people, who know the nuances, who know who the drug dealers are, and who know who the drug users are, and everything. You have to know people. And you cannot bring people from Jamaica or from England or from other places and expect them to uh, to understand the, the nuances of Scranton and the swamp and all those places. You have to have people that come out of those places. So what the government should be doing, what all governments should be doing, is trying to find people from those communities who are capable of being policemen and train them to get back into their neighborhoods to police their neighborhoods. That is a that 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 is that is is not simple. It's not a simple fact, but that is a, a fact that is known psycholo psychologically all over. If you study uh, all, of, all of the great uh, um, anthropology, uh, social anthropologists and sociologists, they will tell you the same thing. Um, they, uh, they, will, they, 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 will, they will tell you the great German psychologist, sociologist, Mark Weber, he did a study about policing in East London and East New York and all those places. And he said that it, in some in on the east side there were more crimes that happened on the west side 
and this, these are in the both cities, New York and, and, and London. And then he did a study there to find out why is it that in one part of the city there was more crimes than the other part. And he said on the west side where you had policemen who were from the west side, when they saw a young boy riding a bicycle without light or something, they would take the bicycle, put it in the back of the police car, and take the take the bicycle home with the boy and tell his parents not to not to let him come out on the streets again. On the east side, where he had policemen who were from the west side, when they went on the east side to work, and they saw a boy riding without light, what they would do, they would bring the criminal system right into in, in, into 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 force as immediately and make a charge against the boy riding without a light, and therefore. There was no communication between the two p di different kinds of people, and so that is what we have we have in Cayman Islands. We need to find community policemen, people who come out of the community, who you can train to get back into community that can understand the nuances of the community. Unless we do that, all the money they can spend, they can have all the money that 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 Dart has, and it will not do any better than 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 what they're doing now. Okay. Our next question: When does a decision become a decision? <clears throat> In essence, that's what that's what the um, the writer uh, is asking. When when is an approve, uh, approval granted? Is it when the board makes a decision or when the applicant receives it? If we if we walk ourselves through a board meeting, you have an agenda. You deal with the items, each item on the agenda. You you make a decision. You record that decision. You have a secretary who's recording that decision. After the meeting is over, sometimes in some meetings, you may decide that we're, we're going to confirm the minutes of the meeting here and now, or the minutes may be too long for that to be done. The secretary will then communicate those minutes to all of the members. The members will look over those minutes, have an opportunity to agree or disagree with or what amend, is recorded or amend, or, or, or amend it. And then at the next meeting, or it may be done by round robin or whatever, you say, yes, we accept the minutes. Once those minutes have been confirmed, then that is where the deci that, that, the, this, those decisions are then binding at that point in time. Uh, am I correct in um, uh, assuming that that's the way it's done? You, uh, I have to refer to my two lawyers here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's usually the way, um, in principle, mm -hmm. these things are done. And each board or authority ought to have some type of guideline mm -hmm. which actually sets, uh, which makes it clear about the decision-making process. The concern that I have based on, the, on what you were sharing was the process that was involved. Mm -hmm. We don't know uh, whether or not the decisions that were made were unanimous by the board. We don't know if the decision was in quorate. You know, we don't know. You want to? Uh, I'll give you a chance to finish your, uh, your yes. thought because we're going to the news. Go right ahead. Yeah, right, so, so it's difficult to make an informed decision if you don't know what the process is. The, cons the real concern, though, is the level of corruption that this appears to speak to. And, you know, whether or not there is any accountability, any transparency that will allow us to make informed decisions, it ought to be, you know, and I mean, like, I don't know the nuances or the details about this particular situation, but we have seen that we've accepted this behavior, you know, um, OC, mm -hmm. no one pays any price or, uh, you know, for, for the kind, this kind of behavior. Okay. Okay. Folks, I want to remind you that you're listening to For the Record. I'm your host, Dorit Connor. My two co-hosts with me this morning... Ms. Theresa Pitcairn, Dr. Steve McField, we're going to the news now. Uh, I want you to continue to listen to Radio Cayman, so listen to Radio Cayman's news, and after the news, for the record, we'll be back. Please stay tuned. Good morning, and welcome back to For the Record in the studio with me this morning, my two co-hosts, Ms. Theresa Pitcairn who's back from her world travels, and Dr. Steve <laughs> McField. <laughs> We, before we went to the news, we were discussing um, a board decision, and uh, I am now better positioned to let our listening audience and viewing audience know exactly what we're talking um, about. I will read from a Cayman News Service article dated 
the 9th of August 2017, and it is entitled Booze Board's Gas Station Decision Faces Audit. And I'll just read the first paragraph, and that will uh, basically give you an initiation into, uh, in, into the, the story itself. Say it reads, a decision by the Liquor Licensing Board to grant Gary Raddy, the owner of Peanuts Convenience Store and Rubis Gas Station in Raid Bay, a license to sell liquor seven days per week is to be reviewed by the government's internal audit unit. Commerce Minister Joey Hugh, who is now who now has responsibility for the liquor board, said that the unit will undertake an independent inquiry to determine why the gas station is allowed to sell booze on Sundays when liquor stores are prohibited from doing so and whether or not the issue is down to a major uh, mix-up. As the incoming minister, he said he was not privy to the history of this application but given the concerns that have been expressed in the community and what he said was the seriousness of the matter, he has decided to request the audit to determine what has happened. So that is what the audit is about, a decision made by the liquor licensing uh, board or Listener that I referred to earlier had another uh, question, and it had to do with approvals. Are they often made subject to uh, uh, approvals? Are often made subject to conditions. So, can there be an approval before the conditions are met? I guess it depends on what what the conditions are. You, you know, you have uh, various conditions. For example, uh, you. St- if you're issuing a work work permit for someone, but that person um, is a foreign national and the 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 um, primary language of that person may not be English, then the board may issue a work permit and it says subject to the person demonstrating that they have sufficient command of the English language, which means that they have to do that English test. And if the person fails that English test, then there is no there is no work permit. Yes, so, so you would submit that back to the board and uh, um, advise the board. The person does not speak English, and then the board can then at that point in time revoke or, or, or say, well, this condition has not been met, so the, the work permit isn't granted. Right, so it's not uncommon to have um, decisions where approval uh, subject to conditions are, are issued, yeah. But 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 one of the, the concerns is when you entrust, uh, when we provide these boards with a certain, and entrust them with certain responsibilities, mm-hmm. and that gets translated into corruption, whether it's for bribery, uh, collusion, conflict of interest, and we don't have a process, or we do have a process, but it's seldom enforced, where folks are actually being forced to be accountable for the behavior. That is something that is pervasive right throughout this entire community. I, I mean, this is why I I now hear many professionals say, we don't even have a state which allows for the recognition and importance of enforcing our law. And and we like a runaway state, you know, in, in, in certain instances. Okay. We have two callers. Let's go to the phone lines. First caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. One caller. Sorry. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, I wanted to um, speak on what Dr. Matt Fields talked about with the policing, mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. getting your um, people from the area. I, I don't I don't call names because of, um, you know, the policies, but if you allow me, it's not nothing bad. But perfect example of that is that from, I'm from Georgetown area previously, and um, there is a police sergeant there that is from our area, I would call it, um, Officer Fran, it is a perfect example of what he's speaking about. I've, I had a situation where I had a business in Central, and everything that happened in that area, if a, if an outside police team, it was a riot, pretty much. Um, I didn't mean riot in a broad <clears> sense, <throat> but, you know, a, a hustle and a bustle. 
And as soon as she stepped in, wherever it was, whether she was off duty or not, you see almost like a, a respect, the respect that she could control. Her one as an officer mm -hmm. could control the whole problem there um, based on the fact that she was one of us. Yep, yep. So Fra and that, that name is Fran, F-R-A-N, yes. That yep. is Fran General. Her yes. name is Fran, Fran General. Fran General, yeah. Mm -hmm. And she, I mean, the way, and, and it doesn't matter how she talks to them, they respect her. So that is that, yeah, when I'm thinking about it, I, when he said that, I remember that, that um, definitely what, what he suggests is what our police need to do get our own people to police us. And there are, there are a lot of good people that can be trained from our area, um, is given the opportunity to, to actually um, be policemen and, and do the areas that they uh, come from. So thank you for that suggestion. Thank you very much, caller. Uh, you know for that as well. And and I'm not going to call names either. But I I hear um, a name um, being moved around in terms of someone who may be returning to the police uh, department to assist with this. And if that is true, then I I think that is, that is heartening. I won't call any names up because nothing is, nothing is official at this point in time, Doc. Well, it, it's I'm thanked. I want to thank the caller for that. <clears throat> For that support, but caller, it's not only literally correct, but it's scientifically proven. That is a scientific proof that you you have to bring people fr from your from your own household to be able to understand the things in your household. You cannot bring people from a different culture, a different household that uh, that 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 uh, that do do not understand what is in your house and you in your neighborhood uh, to be able to get things happen in your neighborhood in a peaceful way there's a for the first thing you're going to get there's not only a clash of personalities but it's a clash of cultures yeah. that, pe that 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 prevents a, a, a peaceful solution to to sometimes just simple problems a simple problems can become complex and as i have said before the the great the great um Max german Weber. german german um sociologist max weber mm -hmm. his what his studies show show us and so, and so, but 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 the, the other thing that I want to, to 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 say is that poor people must understand. Poor people must understand that people do with money and people with power do not care about them. You have to care about your own neighborhood. That is a fact. They do not care if you survive or not, because if they did, the, our successive governments would not allow. People that come from poor countries, where they exploit, where they, they exploit cheap labor and they exploit poverty in the poor countries, and bring them to your country and pay them five and six dollars an hour and three dollars an hour to work. The, and it and it, and it, and and what 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 it shows that he who controls the purse controls the mind, and unless we get up and try to uh, clean up our own neighborhoods and find a solution to ourselves, nobody is going to find a solution for us. They can throw all the money they want into these neighborhoods. And like I have said, they can make, they can pretty them up as much as Dart has pretty up Caymana Bay. And if you don't alter the, the, the mindset of the people who live in neighborhoods, nothing is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Are you still there, caller? Oh, the ca ca caller has gone at this point in time. Okay, thank you very One much for that. So, Dr. and Marshall. so, and so, I just want to make a make a correction. When you oh, said yes. that I was chairman of the uh, uh, Rose Authority Board, no, I was the director of the Rose Authority Board. I was deputy chairman of the Airport Authority Board mm -hmm. for some twelve years, and I directed the Rose Authority Board for some ten years. But the thing I can't understand, Ari and and uh, Teresa, is this: How is it that peanuts or anybody else can sell liquor on the strength of? Here, say mm. that a, 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 a license has been granted. Yeah. The law says that you can only sell liquor for what the board has given you permission to sell unless the license is up on the wall in the premises in which you're selling from. It has to be displayed. The business place. The license has to be there. And if the license is not there, the police can prosecute you for not having the license displayed. And so this whole corruptive situation seems to me to be 
all pervasive in the country now. Everybody accepts things now. It's just like when I was in practicing in criminal courts. And I remember when they had the ganja trials. When somebody was elected, was, was arrested for ganja, the whole courtroom was there. And people would say, oh, boy, we're glad that it's not a hard drug. It's just the soft drugs. And then when the first court kick in, case came in, God, it was so terrible. 10, 15, 20 years imprisonment. And now everything is accepted. The soft drugs, the hard drugs, murder now. Nobody cares about murder now, but it's just an everyday occurrence. And people say, well, yeah, another one got killed. And so we accept things and it becomes part of our routine. And that is the reason, that's the morass that we have gotten into in the last, I would say, the last 30 years in this country. Mm-hmm. Okay. Just Frank, to, Mr. Just Mr. to Mr. touch Go on ahead. something that um, Dr. McField said during mm-hmm. the break when he was trying to identify the numbers and the statistics in terms of the cost and in terms of money that is expended on policing vis-a-vis the actual population. I don't know if I'm Dr. Mac, if you want to just touch on that again. Yes. Okay. We need to take a commercial yes. break, okay. and then when we come back, okay. we, we will touch on that. Folks, yeah. please stay tuned for the record. We'll be back shortly. Good morning, and welcome back to For the Record. Uh, we're going straight into the conversation. I think, uh, Mr. Risa, you were asking uh, uh, Dr. Mac Field to um, elaborate on something that he yeah, during the break, um, earlier. yeah, he was talking about the cost of police of policing. Yes, versus the, the results. The results, and 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 d- let's look at the numbers. We have six to six to three, or I think it's six to four thousand people in the country, and we out of that six to three, we have twenty six thousand work permits. Now, the twenty six thousand work permit holders are not going to be. Um, engaging in firearm possession or drug possession or br- or burglary and all those sort of things because they cannot afford to do that because they will be sent off immediately. So you don't have to worry about them. And then you have something like the 40,000, the 40,000 that are, that are, ex- are uh, subtracted from that, from the 6,000 after you take away the 26,000, say 40,000. When you, when you, when you look at the numbers in the, within the 40,000, half of them are children, the 20,000, half of them are children, and half of them are old people over 60 and retired and, and retired. And so you have, you, you, the, 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 the policing requirement now is between 20 to 25 or 30,000 people. And you have 300 and odd policemen. And you have all the tactical force with all the arms and stuff. And we still we can't, still we can't um, team this country and have a peaceful society? What is wrong with, 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 this, with this whole picture? There has to be something wrong with this picture when you need so many people for, uh, to police um, with, with, with such a small population and such small communities. It seems to me that, that we are spending the money and we are bringing in all these people to say they're policing um, but they're not. We're not getting the consideration for what we're we're spending. Okay. When I was growing up in this country in the 1940s and 50s, the population was 6,000 people, and we had nine police nine policemen for the whole three islands. Nine policemen was the was the contingent of policemen in the whole island, and the place was more peaceful at the time. Now we have all of these policemen and all of these police stations and all of these police vehicles, and yet we cannot seem to be able to, 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 to contain the, all of the things that are happening um, criminal-wise. Criminal it, it, it seems to me that you will never, ever be able to contain the criminality when you have people driving wrong in air-conditioned expensive cars and not on the foot in the neighborhoods where... The things are happening, and they say, and well, you look at what they've changed it to now. It's just a service. Okay. It's not a force anymore. It's just become a, a police service now. It's not a service they're doing for us now. It's not enforcing anything anymore. We have three callers. Let's go to the phone lines. First caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Good good morning, Mr. O.C. Good morning, ma'am. Good, good morning, Mr. morning. Miss Theresa, and good morning to Dr. Steve Maxfield. Good morning, Mr. Georgia. 
get e bank. See, Dr. Steve, you could not have said it better. I, I, your thoughts or my thoughts were put into words by you. And before I forget my manners, I'm doing that right now. I trust that all, all three of you can say that you and your family members are well. And, and Ms. Teresa, it's so nice to hear you back. Thanks. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think it is perfectly, perfectly ridiculous with a force the size of ours that in this neighborhood, the neighborhood in which I live, Windsor Park, it has grown immensely since I came here um, many, many years ago. And we, we do not have an officer for this area. And if I live to hear the police come on your show, Mr. O.C., I will be asking that question again. Mm -hmm. Why doesn't this area not a neighborhood, the huge area. We used to have an officer here years ago, but on, and he was a great man. I admired him. He came and visited with most of the neighbors personally, but he either got rolled over, at least he, he's not here anymore. So that's my question. Why doesn't this area have an officer. And I thank you, Mr. O.C., for giving me all the chance to run up my mouth, as I call it. <laughs> and may God bless all the people on our three islands. And let us all not forget to pray for people, all those people up in Texas. Remember, many, many Caymanian yes, families live there. Yes. Thank you very much. God bless. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Miss Georgette, you, for that. Let's go to our second oh. caller. Caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Good morning, caller. Welcome to For the Record. Hello. Yes, good morning. Yes, good morning. Um, I was thinking back on what Mr. Matfield said, Dr. Matfield said about breaking down the numbers of people on the island, but... He should know, and I think he. Uh, there's evidence of it that there's a lot of undocumented individuals on this island over stairs, and then there's you cannot rule out the work permit holders as not needing to be policed. That's where a lot of the crime is centered. Um, by him saying that, then it sounds like. The criminals are only Caymanians. We import a lot of work permit holders who are criminals. And there's a lot of undocumented in individuals which the um, task force on immigration need to crack down on and find them. I would dare say immigration do not, does not know how many overstairs in the island. They, they, they don't know who uh, was supposed to leave. They don't, it's out of control. That's why our country is out of control. And until a moratorium is put on work permits and everybody's got sorted out, task force go out and find them. And if you don't have a paper, then you're un undocumented. You're staying here illegally and get them out. You'll never be able to police this place properly till we weed out and get the total amount of people living on this island. That last um, 2010 um, census isn't correct. Thank you. Thank you very much, caller. Let's see if we can grab the last two, mm -hmm. two more calls. No more calls. No more calls. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Ms. Well, Susan. Should we take the commercial break now, and then, and then we can come back and have more time to talk after. Folks, for the record, we'll be back shortly. Good morning. Welcome back to For the Record. We have two callers on hold. Let's go to the phone lines. First caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, good morning to all you folks there. Good Hope morning. Well. I guess I'll be called the big murder of the morning, but I guess that doesn't really matter to me because I'm speaking to my 
I said I would like to remind you all that if we remember what we're talking about, the policing of Cayman mm-hmm. has come to. It's going to remember very good. It's going to go back to the Campora situation where, and you can tell that they took Cayman. They said Cayman was the monetary, and they took Cayman for a game. And they had the photos out on top of the boats having the parties for Cayman when they should have been doing Cayman work. Send that message across. You don't need to come to Cayman to do no work. All you got to do is come get paid. And as we can see, in my opinion, that's all we're doing is getting people to get paid. But they're getting well paid, but they're not doing no work. Because if they're doing work, our, our Caymanians that never made any money in both days when Cayman had, when they built Cayman, we didn't have this racket. But until we let in all these foreigners that are coming to police us, which biggest of crimes are coming from them, that's where our mess comes from. And they're not going to better until we decide that we can take back Cayman. And do our own people to do their own work. That's how you get Cayman work done, by getting the Caymanian people to do the job. But until then, they just come in here to milk Cayman because Cayman is a milking cow. And has been always a milking cow, especially for the last 20 years. And, they've, and every day you can see a new face joining Cayman, whether it's in security, whether it's police, or anything that, that is good paid job because they want a stationary job. And the Caymanians are the ones that are on the corners boys selling the drugs and everything else or, 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 or the street bombing people for a dollar. It's no, no foreigners out there. Where are foreigners bombing? I guess eventually when, when we decide to take him on back, we'll have them on our corners too. Mm-hmm. As far as I'm concerned, I'm sorry to be, as a, as a chief immigration officer, should know that when you fill out the immigration form that says that you're solvent, that means that you've made yourself, say that you can maintain yourself as long as you're in Cayman. Mm-hmm. As far as I'm concerned, when you, when you go, go on my social services to be maintained, by my my taxpayers' money, you should be returned back to your country and are safely told because there's no Caymanian that is leaving from Cayman to go to the next man's country to, to become a burden to them because most of them, most Caymanians are coming home. If we got them over there that are burden to other countries, they are worthless and they don't want anything out of life because they would return to their country because if Cayman is so good for everybody else, it's, it's better for their own. So far as they're concerned, that's what I got to say for the morning. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, caller, for that. Well expressed. Uh, next caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Good morning, Mr. Connor and Mr. St- uh, Steve and Mr. Uh, Teresa. Good, good morning, morning, sir. Good morning, Captain Paul. Oh, you don't recognize me. Oh, definitely, yeah. Captain Paul. I just uh, want to... <coughs> <the> way, <coughs> excuse me. My cousin, uh, Honorable Sybil McLaughlin, a happy birthday. Today oh, is her birthday. Wow. Thank you. Didn't happy mean. birthday. I'm Great. glad you remind you, us of that. Thanks, thanks for reminding us. Thank we you. want to wish her a uh, happy birthday as well. Okay, thank you. For, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Captain Paul. Okay. Uh, I just want to address... I just want to address... We have one more caller. Oh, go on. Mm-hmm. Uh, caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Good morning. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning to your panel. Good morning. Good morning. You know, um, some of the things the lady that was just saying there is, is so true, but I just want to say this morning that we need to stop the talk and do the walk here, mm-hmm. came on. All we're doing is just talk, 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 and getting no results. And I just want to say, you know, with this hurricane that just got off there, um, that's up there in Texas and so forth, you know, it, it breaks my heart to see what those guys are going through. And here we are sitting on an island. We're sitting on water, and we got water above us, and it rains. And we, they say we're preparing here and there, but Mr. Corner, I can't see no preparation going on. No way. The peak season got to be here just in a couple of days. And then we got the Anna Washer coming for Hurricane Ivan. I don't see nobody doing anything out here just in, just in case. And I pray to my God that nothing happened to us this hurricane season. But when you say no one, you, you, are you talking about the government? Or are you talking about people, people individually? In general. Yeah, people okay. In general. I drove through my neighborhood um, this weekend, and if you see the things that is in people's yards, that can be a hazard if anything was to come to the Cayman Island. We are doing absolutely nothing. And Cayman need to wake up and start doing the, the, the walk and stop the talk because we're just running our mouth every day on the radios, and we're not accomplishing anything here in Cayman. I got a lot more to say, but I'll leave you all at that for right now. I may call back later, though. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Please feel free to call back if you want to. No more calls? Uh, Dr. McPhail, you wanted to... Uh, yes, I just wanted to... The caller who mentioned about the about the number of work permit holders and, and stuff, and they, and they commit crimes. Well, that's the reason why I said so sarcastically. We have 26,000 people 
who are in work with are not supposed to get into trouble. They're not supposed to be committing crime. They're not supposed to 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 to, to be selling drugs. They're not supposed to be having having selling un- numbers. Selling numbers. <laughs> they're not supposed to to be to be having unlicensed yeah. firearms. That's the that was a sarcastic remark that I made. They're not supposed to be in problems. So the police should not be should should not have to have to worry about them. That's the problem that we have. Because we have not vetted people properly and we let everybody in. We let people in from Honduras. But, but Doc, to- isn't, that, isn't that human nature, though? That uh, I mean, we, we're dealing with, with human nature, even though we're not supposed to because, uh, you know, we're here on a work permit and we, we're coming here to work. But isn't it human nature? Because when you, when you add all of the other things to it, they start to socialize. They go to a bar and they uh, drink and they become in, inebriated. And uh, that, that, that's part of human nature. So as perfect as we would want it to be that people come here, sit down, do their work, uh, keep their nose to the grindstone, and uh, it's, it's not going to happen. But there's an additional yeah. element, though, O.C., in that when you bring folks to do certain jobs, and as uh, Dr. McField was speaking to the point earlier, uh, where you exploit other communities and you bring folks here and pay them uh, wages which don't allow them to live a mm-hmm. reasonable mm-hmm. life, mm-hmm. they will, yes, yes, try to find other sources of income. And you know, y- you know, so that is human nature in wanting to to be to do better and to to earn earn a lot more. The question is, so we're we, actually we, importing the crime. To a certain uh, that's yes, that's yes, the point yes, I'm exactly. making. That's exactly the point I'm making. So, but this is not rocket science. OC, none of this is rocket science. I always go back to the, the to the to the issue who do we hold responsible for all of these things we hear people call in on this show all the time about we going to do this and we going to do that we going to do that but who ultimately should be responsible you know and and I'm I'm just throwing that question out there again okay now we're going to um, I'm going to go back to the uh, strategic policy statement and the uh, premier's uh, response because we want to uh, revert back now to uh, the issue of uh, community policing. Um, it says uh, the immediate response has to be uh, more effective uh, uh, policing, talking about crime and stuff. It says my government has met with and received the requests from the police commissioner for new resources to tackle crime in our, on our streets, particularly planned investment in community policing. I will now note now that we were not able to entirely meet his requests as the costs exceeded the available funding. But we also had concerns with the request to increase the officer count by a significant number requiring overseas recruitment without sight of an overall plan for action. So he had concerns because he didn't uh, have sight of an overall plan for action. That notwithstanding, We are committed to providing a substantial number of new officers, 75, over the next three years together with added civil service support staff. We campaigned on the need for improvements to community policing, and I was heartened that the commissioner is of the same view, and this is one of his priority areas. That said, I have asked that he looked into utilizing a community warden approach as has been used in the United (laughs) Kingdom and elsewhere to enhance the community policing effort rather than police constables who may be better utilized solving crime. I was encouraged that he has agreed to look at this. So the commission has agreed to look at it. It's not carved in stone yet, right? The community warden approach has the benefit of not only utilizing a suitable person who will know the people in the communities served, but imp- but importantly, they will know and trust him or her. Community wardens need to be trained to understand aspects of the law and some policing methods, but do not have the full resp- uh do not have to fulfill the requirements of a trained police officer. Indeed, there may be former police officers who, though retired, are still fit enough 
to serve in a warden capacity. So, he, you know, he has laid out the different, uh, the various nuances and, uh, you know, some of ways that it could be addressed as well. Comments? Well, the first thing I would say is that he wants to, um, he wants to commit to providing 75 officers over the next three years, years. together with added civil servant support. Well, it seems to me that the premier and the commissioners of police who have come before and those who are in charge of the security of our country should know that this is an ongoing matter. And there should have been already yesterday a police college at the University of the, of the University College of the Cayman Islands where people could be trained in policing, sociology, and social anthropology, urbanization, and everything like that should be trained. Because that's where police is going now. It's not just um arresting someone and um and 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 and, and, and for possession of drugs. It's also um knowing how the community works and how to calm the community and how and 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 and, and to respond to, to 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 people needs and psychological needs and and, and 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 social needs and so it seems to me that if you are going to have 75 people over the next three years you should select 75 Kimanyan young people men and women and train them so that you don't have to bring people from recruit from overseas okay uh, and and the, and the other approach why while why why I why I while I while I I I am at odds with with coming to wardens it's better than nothing it's better than having no one in the community but the only thing about community wardens are is that they have no enforcement jurisdiction and well I I guess that would depend on what uh you know the purview that you that you uh, offer to them in terms of the way that you that, that you craft the, what the terms what, and conditions terms yeah, of, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know how much power you actually give them mm -hmm. but but and he says you, uh, so here he says community wardens need to be trained to understand aspects of the law and some police and methods but do not have to fulfill the requirements of a trained police officer mm -hmm. that's what it means they have yeah. no enforcement jurisdiction mm -hmm. as a mm -hmm. police officer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so when you go in the community for the first week or two or two months and the people understand that well you can't do anything about what they have they have been doing they are going not to they, they are going to ignore you as yeah. a warden. Yeah. But you can't do anything, but if you set the uh, procedures in place that that community, that warden, then transmit whatever information that he has a liaison within the police service so that it doesn't stop with him, but it moves things uh, you know, up the chain, then, then fine. Well, see, I agree, disagree with you. They, they, you. You have to have the presence of, of, of enforcement there that people know that if they do something, there's going to be enforcement mechanism that comes into place. But where do we have that now? You you can't have a police officer on every corner. Well, you can't have a police officer in front of everyone's door. Well, you can have a police officer in every neighborhood, like Mr. George has said, mm -hmm. in, in Quincy Park. Mm -hmm. You can have a police officer in Northward. You can have a police officer in, in Dog City. Mm -hmm. You can have a police officer in the swamp. Don't tell me that that's not possible. Because oh, if we have no, that that is possible. Well, that but, is I, but I, I I would I I, I wouldn't um, take the defeatist <clears throat> approach that by having a warden there that people are not going to believe that effect effective actions can still be taken. Well, all the warden going to be doing conveying conveying information, but 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 and when people understand that that's what all his position is going to be, it's going to be the same as before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You have to have policing, real policing. That people respect the uniform, people mm -hmm. respect the police officer. That's what you need in the community. Okay, we're going to go to headline news. When we return, for the record, we'll continue to discuss this very important uh, aspect of our lives here in the Cayman Islands. Good morning and welcome back to For the Record. Uh, I have one um, email from one listener and says, uh, um, why are we so surprised by the ineffectiveness of the Royal Cayman Islands Police? We hire people from countries where crime is out of control and salaries are low for the police officers there. Why do we believe they are coming to Cayman because they want to help fight crime in Cayman? No, they are here for a better living 
only Caymanians will care about Cayman. It amazes me how we do the same thing over and over mm -hmm. and expect different results. That was one of our uh, listeners who sent that email in to us and said that. I agree with that, mm -hmm. and 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 that brings me, that brings me to the to the to the to the point where, you see, here again, we here again, we bring people in from from these um, impoverished countries. We exploit their poverty, and we bring them, and we and we can only and and we find a way to not pay them, to pay them a little more than. Much more than they're making in their own country, because six dollars an hour is a whole lot more than they're making in a country when their salary is six dollars a day. And then you bring policemen from other countries who really comes for the better salary, because if he wants to be a good policeman and if he wants to advance in the police force, he would stay in his country where he is a policeman, because there were better, there would be better chances for advancement there. And, and 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 if he really wants to be a policeman to satisfy his 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 longing for 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 to, to bring peace to his community he would stay there but a lot of them come because of the good salary the good salary and the good perks that that along with it and to get out of the country in which they in which they in which in which they are are, are living and so here we are no the, we have not sat down and 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 talk this thing through. I and and I, I disagree with the with the caller who said all we do on the radio station is talk and talk. That's what we're here for. Well, see, I, I don't <laughs> think that the caller was talking about us in particular. Yeah, well, but well, you're talking about general you know, in general. Well, general and so forth and so and so and so. The 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 government has never come to the people. The only time that these things are discussed. Is when they are campaigning for election every four years. They say we are going to do this, we are going to do that. Or but if they there's have, a tragedy. Or there's a tragedy, but they have never come to the police, people in a in a community set and say, We this is what do you think about this? And we we'll, want your feedback and they accept our feedback. They have okay. never done that. We have one caller. Let's go to the phone lines. Caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Good morning, OC. No, morning, yes. sir. Morning, Dr. Steve. Good morning. Good morning. morning. I heard your um Dr. Steve, you made a great statement there <clears throat> about the people coming here or the police coming here. But, um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, that email that you read, Mr. O.C., is perfectly also, is a perfect statement. Um, I got a question to ask. What, what's happening or what is going on with our school leavers? How many school leavers are leaving our high schools per year? Any of you know that amount? That, that amount? That an Number? average of about 300 okay. per school, 250 to 300 per school, not necessarily the and private schools. And how many schools we have? Let's say 250. How many schools It's we about have? 700, not a year. So let's just say 700. And you're telling me now that out of 700 per year, we cannot find at least 20 out of those students to go and train as a police? And I see the same thing in planning. I went over to the BRAC about five, six months ago with the builders board, because I'm on that board. And these, the BRACers are sitting there in a meeting telling me that, I'm telling the board that there's no uh, planners, <clears throat> sorry, no planners in the BRAC. So I said to them, well, you produce some of the best students within these three islands. Why don't you recruit at least two and get them trained up to be your planner? Not a one of them. I'm, it went straight over the head. I have a problem with that. We, I don't know where we're going with this, but it's our fault. We need to be more proactive and mm. getting things done and stop, you know, just waiting for, for something like what Mr. Gilbert McLean speaks of, a dragon to drop out the sky and do something for us. Okay? But we have to get the training done from the school. Mm -hmm. We cannot take these guys off the street where... They already passed that stage to, 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 to try to, to up, upskill them. I'm not saying they're all reject, but we need to grab the kids out of the school. We have a lot of good kids coming out of the school. That's where we need to start recruiting. And I don't see any department trying to go that route. I've been to meetings with the education department, and I suggest to them, the NWDA, 
go to the school and recruit them. If you want help within the industry, the construction industry, I will go with you and let me recruit the young ones out the school to train and upskill them. We're not getting nobody out of the school. We let them hit the street first, and then they go down their road. Um, that's all I have to say. You all have a good day, and thanks for listening to me. Thank you very much, Carla. Thank you very much. What, what, one of the questions, uh, and, and I want to take note of this because we want to uh, ask uh, the police when they come on on Wednesday, even though you know they're, talk- they're going to be talking about recruitment. So it's, mm-hmm. it's more of their opportunity to have the platform to talk about it. But we will have some constructive um, questions you know, for them as well. And the one that I would want to ask is, how do we make the police service more attractive to young people? Caymanians to want to, to want to join to, to want to join. How do we do that? And not necessarily young Caymanians, but Caymanians in general. Because a few um, uh, weeks ago, maybe last week, I spoke about the fact that what about persons who may want to change careers? <laughs> uh, you know, who have postgraduate degrees. How can you encourage them? to come in to the police service, even if they come in at the level uh, of Entry a constable, level. but mm-hmm. you reward them for the... Um, Transferable skills and experience the skills that and they skills and experience have. that they have in mm-hmm. the qualifications, that mm-hmm. you reward them for that so that they start at a higher increment mm-hmm. and they feel, well, at least I'm being rewarded for you know, what I have, and then they can quickly work their way up the ladder because those, those um, you know, should uh, be what, what they call in, 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 um, in, in, some, in, in some instances in, 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 the, uh, in the profession, uh, f- high rollers or, or fast movers in terms mm-hmm. of moving up the ladder. I'm sorry, I, I just got mm-hmm. stuck there for a minute. And, and, and comments yeah, on that. Yeah, and policemen can, Caymanians can go and be policemen in New York and in Philadelphia mm-hmm. and all those places. They can go there and they can be policemen there and those big, and those big citizens as, as one, as, as one person I think was, um, was one lady had, had, had one, one Caymanian had written his mother and said he was living in New York City and when they asked uh, the, the lady, well, can you tell me uh, the, in, the, in the New York State uh, in city, what city he was, and she said it was she can't remember, but it was but it, the city was but an animal, and so she said was it Albany? No, and she said was it um was it um was it was it was it was it Brooklyn? No, and she said was it Buffalo? Yeah, one of them big animals up there was <laughs> been, was one of those <laughs> big animals New like but one big <laughs> animals like one of them big animals. Well, they can go there and they can be policemen there. They can be transit policemen there. They can be mayors there. They can be all kind of stuff there. But they can't be in their own country. It's because well, we have we have done that to ourselves. We have we have told ourselves that the only people who can be policemen and who can do all of these jobs are someone who comes from overseas. Mm-hmm. Okay, we have two callers. Let's go to the phone lines. First caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Yeah, good morning, Miss Teresa. Morning. Good morning, Dr. Morning, uh, good morning. Good morning. Dr. Mark and Posey. How's everybody today? Okay. Morning, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, talking about the police, you know, I'm a retired police. And our son, he applied three times. Now, he is a high school graduate. He has not a certificate, a diploma. And the first time when he didn't sit the test, they said that um, the test wasn't bad, but he couldn't read a statement. When I joined the police force, I couldn't read a statement either. I thought that I would be part of a training. So that he was refused for that. And I understand that they got people in there that still been there for a long time and still can't write a proper statement. And for me, I don't feel that it's right because a policeman really just need to be trained the right and proper way and how common sense you can read, you can write, you can figure. But they want you with a bachelor's or a doctorate degree to join the police force. And all of that I don't think is right because that is why they're not getting the the, 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 the Caymanians to join the force because they're being so discouraged. Just to write a statement, that's what they told me. 
he need to write a statement um, properly. That is, that is what part of training is all about. I spent six months in Barbados. I spent six months in Barbados. That's what it, they have a training school for. So that's all I have to say this morning, gentlemen. But I don't think it's going to get any better in Cayman. I really don't think because all we're doing, is, um, the leader said we're talking, and we got to talk, but we can do our part, but it's rest to the, to the other departments to do their part. So it's a sad situation because I was talking to a police officer a couple of days ago, and I asked him about his notebook, and he was he, he was like, man in the moon, he don't know what he talking about notebook. He said, no, how no notebook? They do him hardly carry notebooks in their pocket now. You know, so it, it, I, I don't know what's going to happen, but something really needs to be done instead of bringing in all of these foreign police. Here. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you very much, caller. Uh, two more callers. Uh, first caller. Uh, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Good, Mr. Ossie, this is me again. Uh, morning again, Captain Paul. Yeah, uh, been, uh, but this is a very interesting conversation about the police. But I... Uh, uh, am I correct that there was something in the paper a few days ago telling about how much overtime that the, is owed to these police officers? I think there was a question in finance committee uh, in, in relation to it. Um, or uh, if it wasn't in finance committee, it may have been during question time. I think uh, MLA Arden uh, McLean may have posed the question. Uh, and uh, in the news, there was some indication that some police officers had accepted uh, where they were paid 50 cents on the dollar, I believe, for the outstanding overtime that they had accumulated. And those officers who uh, rejected that proposal, they were uh, given all of their leave. And uh, as a result of that, I believe that they, they may have been short staffed because those officers then had to take their leave. You're absolutely correct, Captain Paul. Yes, but how do you expect to get to keep morale high if you uh, depriving people of the pay what they work for? Mm -hmm. I mean, that is on. All I can talk about is ships because I spent most of my life on there. But it was two things that you kept uh, uh, people happy with good food and a decent pay. Yeah. Treat, give people what they're entitled to. And, and uh, because they have families to. Uh, to, to uh, I'm not. Uh, defendant saying that all of them is good, but they, if if they're not good, get rid of them. Get rid of them, and those are there doing their work. Because that is demoralizing. You work so hard because working overtime that means over and above what you was the eight hours you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the guys they sleep and probably had something else to do on their day off and couldn't. And then you go to de deny them their money. That's criminal. That, 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 to me, that, that's a, it's no wonder they're having trouble. Hmm. Thank you for listening to me again. Thank you very much, Captain Paul. One more caller. Good morning. Welcome to For the Record Caller. Morning, Mr. O.C. Morning, Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Good morning, Mrs. Um, Pitcairn. Morning. Johan Moxham here. Hi. Just a quick, always great to listen to you guys. Jumping straight into it. Sir, um, we have some great police officers in the force, both local and from abroad. Um, they deserve our, our support. Um, I know I will do whatever I can to aid them because uh, crime and safety is possibly the most important thing um, for us as, as people here in the Cayman Islands, and it's what distinguishes us and along with our economic standing in comparison to um, a lot of the, the, the other countries in, in the jurisdiction. However, as great as the officers are, and there are many hardworking, especially Caymanian officers, some from abroad, the, the, the force needs a comprehensive uh, review from some sort of independent body because we keep having the same conversation over and over and it's like 10, 15, 20 years in the making. Look at all of the high-ranking um, Caymanian um, officers that have left the force for, in my mind, lesser jobs. You know them personally. All these guys wanted to do was be police officers. Um, so there, there must be something that's going on that causes uh, patriotic persons who just can't deal with the madness anymore and say, you know what, let me move, let me move on. Um, when you consider the fact that you have legal cases um, before the courts where obviously there's allegations of discrimination within the RCIPS, where locals can be retired um, at a particular age, brought back at a lower rank, mm -hmm. yet other senior officers from abroad um, 
don't retirees. Yeah, yeah, they, they don't they don't get they don't get subjected to any of those sort of, of, of conditions. You have to say that these are now systemic issues. Yeah. Um, where else in the civil service would that happen? But I'd also say this: the worst level of PR for the RCIPS that everybody wants to conveni- conveniently forget. When 24 kilos of cocaine and 60 mm. kilos of weed can yeah. walk out of the secure lockup and there is no level of accountability, <laughs> there is no head that rolls, they just hope that it goes away. Um, I'm just letting you know, people like me that pay attention, we won't let that happen because I'm prepared to bet money. If there was any form of Caymanian involved or alleged to be involved in that process, if there was a Caymanian police commissioner at the time, his head would be on a pike yeah. outside of the box building. Mm-hmm. That's the way that things operate. When they have, what they should do is have interviews with all of those senior officers who have left, ask why and what would it take for them to come back because um, Mr. Ennis and Mr. Walton, they have my respect. I think they're great people. I think they're great officers. But unless you're holding the, the <coughs> police service to a standard with, with relevant key performance indicators, we are just throwing money away. There are some officers that we bring in from abroad that are on vacation. They're the rudest people under the sun, yeah. and they treat everybody like you're a criminal. We're now, I know that I can be a pain Johan. in the neck. I can be a pain in the neck, but, yeah. but come on now. I don't treat anybody um, in, in a uniform with any level of, 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 of disrespect. Disregard, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. You know, but let me tell you, I've seen instances where I'm like, the police want respect, but they don't understand the basic concept of respect begets respect, and there apparently is three different standards within the force and zero accountability based on what I've just said. So unless the governor, the premier, the National Security Council, and the police commissioner are prepared to address these issues, and again, just let me say, there are some amazing officers, you will always have these issues because you cannot expect for sensible law-abiding citizens to pretend that these things aren't happening. Mm-hmm. Um, why are we giving you more money when you can't seem to cover off on the basics? Yeah. You know, so those caller? Are questions to be asked. Yep. I'm going to ask you to leave us there. Uh, we have to go to a commercial break. Uh, thank no you very problem. much, caller. Uh, please stay tuned for the record. We'll be back shortly. Good morning and welcome back to For the Record. We have two final calls for the morning on hold. So we're going to take those calls and uh, those will be the, unfortunately, the last two calls for this morning. First caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Good morning, O.C. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning, my friend, Steve. Good morning. Uh, all my friends. But, um, yeah, I, this is, you know, I'm glad that you guys are sitting down discussing these things. This, when, you, when you get on, because we need to get some clarification on a lot of stuff that's happening. And when, we, when I look around and I see constantly, somebody mentioned that, People coming from the same jurisdiction all the time. It indicates to me there's somebody within the police force who is vouching for these people, somebody who's in authority, and vouching for some of these, these, these police officers, those that come here and they got police records and they have, you know, done things over there and they still get to the, the system, which tells me that the graft is rampant in those areas. They can get paid off to get give people a good police report and all this shit. And then, you know, it's it's a shame what's happening to us in this island. We got Caymanians, like as somebody called in, talked about a, a young man that was trying to get his uh, get the police force. But they, they, there's a foreign national that is that is vetting his application, you know. It's not a Caymanian. These are the things that we have to start changing. Because if we don't, we're going to continue to grow. I mean, when we had the, the status grant, I cried out about the, the system, what I saw happen there. There was no, no, no vetting of anything. They just anybody who came in and said, well, I, I want my status. I've been here for two years. There was nobody said, they was, oh, my God, it's big, big, we're, like, we're like a bunch of kids in a play yard. Everybody wants to have, have the rules their way. And we don't have a system. I get so aggravated, ladies and gentlemen, when I see what's happening to this island. Not because it, 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 people are that, that in, in the, they are dumb, but because nobody seems to care. Nobody takes responsibility or accountability. And we let things go down the drain in each day. It's getting worse.
And when I look around now and I see the number of foreign nationals in this country, and when I see the number of Caymanians, don't tell me that they're all lazy. That's not so. But because we got people, foreign nationals, in high places within government and otherwise, that they can do what they want and they're looking after their own. It's not that hard if they want to do it. You, you make rules. But we had rules and they've started to let them slide by the way. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much, caller, for that. We are getting to the point in time where we're going to close off. Just want to read one um, message that I received from one uh, listener and says, "Why not use JPs in the di- districts to, uh, you know, to help with, uh, you know, um, policing or crime fighting as well?" And I believe I may have another one. Let me uh, uh, make sure. Yep. Um, this one says, "Good morning to you and your panel." Um, they, that, uh, we believe that until elected representatives collectively are able to put uh, Caymanians at the helm and teach our young people the importance of uh, protecting our tranquil tourism finan- uh, uh, and financial sector and uh, way of life uh, give uh Given the insensitivity of the majority of uh, the police force, uh, our expatriates and only have interest in the end of the month pay, which basically uh, mirrors exactly uh, what uh, you all have been saying as well. Let me see what the other one says. Um, Okay, this one's a little bit long to read. We'll have to deal with that on the next sitting mm. of For the Record. Um, some closing comments from you, Mr. Reeson and Dr. Steve Macfield, please. Yeah, so some of the comments that um, one of our callers made, Johan, who identified himself, I concur with them. In fact, I made quite a few notes before he even came on, and he, we literally mirrored the, uh, the, the issues that he raised. But... There was another caller that called in about um, having some a relative uh, try to get employment with the, within the police. And what I wanted to say was that it is one thing for us to have what I call soft skills like conflict resolution, adaptability, nonverbal cues, and empathy, and you walk into the police with these skills. But there is also the need to have um, the 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 formal educational skills in order to be um, to 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 do the job effectively. Now we know that there has been a failure within the school system to educate our kids to the level where they need to be, so that they become functioning members of the community. And I've raised it on this uh, show before that you know it's not so much criticizing all teachers, criticizing all civil servants and all of that, because I'm not in the in that criticism business. What I want to do is that now we know what the issues are, we take really proactive and creative steps to right a lot of these wrongs so that we start to include the Caymanian community at the level where they're at and develop programs so that they become functional, so that they can function effectively in the um in the community and find their place mm-hmm. their legitimate place thank you very much miss t uh doc i believe in nation building and nation building is more than just giving churches money and thousands of dollars nation building is is when you have a plan of where your country is going to go 50 or 100 years from now in many uh, countries um that is the thing i remember when i was at university of british columbia i was um doing research for a book called American Impact on Canada. And what I found out um, then is that back in the 1940s, before the war, the Corps of, the U.S. Corps of Engineers had decided that the West Coast of Canada would be the place where they were going to transfer, they had to transfer a lot of people if there was a war, a war that, that would hit the East Coast, New York, Philadelphia, and all those big cities, and the population would have to be moved west. And from then, the Corps of Engineers had a plan 
to move so many millions of people out west and even the, how they were going to get power and electricity to, to them. And as a result of that, they had a plan to dam the Columbia River, which was a Canadian river coming out of Canada down down to the, to the west. And this caused a lot of problems in Canada when they found out what the plans were. But they, those plans were over 50 years old when I went there. Okay. So... The problem that we have here is that we do not have um, an, um, um, a, a nation building plan. Nation building is not only, like I say, giving churches money, but nation building is understanding how many policemen you're going to need for the next 40 years. How, what, what is your population is going to be? Um, what are the crime statistics? How many detectives you're going to need? How many patrol men you're going to need? How many firemen you're going to need? How many doctors you're going to need? Right, right, right now we have the situation where we don't have any Caymanian dentists. We have Dr. Aileen Marin was the last living Caymanian dentist and when he deceased there was none. You would think that, that was a, that's a lucrative profession where, where Caymanians would be, um, where, where the establishment would go into the schools and would ask and would ask the teachers who are the best science, the people with the best okay. science grades and stuff, and get people involved into going out to be dentists and to provide the, the professions that we're going to need in the future. That is what I call a condition subsequent. And so, and so, and so here we are. We have no say in, in what's going on, but I would suggest that we go back to something that uh, the Honorable uh, George McCarthy um, and, and the Honorable, the, and the late Honorable Mr. Um, 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 I can't remember his, 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 name, his first name right now, but he was the Chief Office Chief Secretary, then he became first leader of government business, J Tom Jefferson. They, they started something called the Government Private Sector Advisory Committee. Consultative. Consultative Committee. Committee, where they consulted with people from the private sector to better, to better, to better understand how the, pri the private sector works, not only the commercial private sector, but everything in the private sector. Um, private sector, people from those communities, from these communities that we're talking about that our trouble should be on the committee so that they can have a voice. Unless we do that, unless we have a plan for where are we going to be 50 years from now, we're not going to be in a further, but knocking over heads and finding, throwing money after bad money. Okay, I have one more uh, email that I'd like to read before. It says, good morning, Mr. Connor. It is surprising that if government is serious about border protect protection, uh, policing, and security, why haven't the government committed to implementing the fingerprinting system at our port and uh, airport? Since we have already purchased the equipment, this could be a quick win for government and will show their resolve towards stronger borders while addressing one element of our crime uh, problem. The solution offered by the new commissioner of more money and hiring more foreign officers is not real, a real solution. We will only begin to solve our crime problem when we hire and train locals as police teachers, prison officers, and judges. Government should spend more on training our own people, not on hiring foreign officers who do not have a vested interest and will send home most of their salary, weakening our economy. Folks, I want to thank you, our listening and viewing audience, for allowing Radio Cayman and, by extension, for the record, into your homes, into your vehicles, as you traverse the busy roads of the Cayman Islands, into your places of work, whether it be an office cubicle or if you're working in the outdoors. I also want to remind you that we are our brothers and our sisters, keepers there is always someone out there who's less fortunate than we are and i ask you to extend a helping hand to them if you can't do that then i suggest you donate to a the charity because we always want to consider those who need not necessarily those who want i say to you have a great day continue to support your radio station radio k man join sterling Dwayne banks at 12 noon for talk today be blessed and as usual we ask the good lord to bless these three beautiful wonderful Cayman Islands. Thank you. Informative, impartial, insightful. This is your talk show. 1-800-534-8255. Your calls, your input. This is For the Record.